We will begin our first panel discussion right away with absolutely no breaks. And the first topic for today is very invigorating and I'm sure all of you are interested to uh, know a little bit more about our speakers' opinions. So ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, let's move forward to our first panel discussion of the day. Our first topic for today is, should politicians have a say in formulating education policy? We'd like to welcome our speakers with a lot of dignity and pride this morning. We have with us Mr. Sachin Pilot, former Union Minister. A big round of applause. Mr. Shaheen Mistri, founder, Teach for India. Mr. R. Sharit Kumar, actor, politician and founder. All India, Samatwa Makal Kachi. And our chairperson this morning, Ms. Preeti Sinha, senior president and global convener. Yes Institute. A big round of applause ladies and gentlemen for our first panel and let me just quote on the wrong topic right here. So should there be profit in education? That is the topic that we will be discussing right in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let me just give you the rules for the first panel discussion. So the chairperson will speak first and then invite the other panelists to express their views on the topic. Each speaker will get about eight to nine minutes to express their views individually. After everyone has spoken, the chair will then open the topic to everyone for a group discussion, post which we will have a Q&A session. So thank you very much for joining us and Ms. Preeti Sinha, please do take over. Good morning. I thought I'd have to be like a teacher in front of the class, but as you know, education is now evolving and the teacher should be on the side and getting kids to be as inquisitive as the minister said. So it's my privilege to uh, start this panel and share it. I run a think tank, a practicing think tank in New Delhi called Yes Institute. It's part of Yes Bank. And our purpose is to try to bring private capital into India's development aspects. So we would love to find solutions where our private sector plays a role. For that, I think I'd like to add some more numbers to what the Minister just said. As you know, there are 1.4 million basic education schools. That's about 900,000 on the government side, 500,000 sort of privately run. There are around 36,000 institutions of higher learning. So given all that, just going again on the figures, central government, central GDP should be about 6% on education. But in reality, about 3 to 4% is being spent, out of which higher education is getting 1.5% 1, 1 spent. So the point here we are trying to address in this panel is, should there be profit in education? And that's the central question here. Is there enough money being invested in, in education? And so those are the central government figures, those are the government um, aspects. What can private sector do? My uh, key theme is that we need to create a more equitable society in India. And world-class standards in education are key for that, to have equitability in India. I'd like to just kind of uh, frame four things before I turn to the panelist. One is, the question is now changing from access to quality. You know, with Sarva Shiksha now, students are in, in schools, but what is the quality? Uh, we need better infrastructure, better sports infrastructure. New challenges are emerging. When I went to school, I don't think we talked about climate change. Now we need to get our kids oriented towards issues that are present and in the future. So access turning to, turning to quality. Second is the PPP model. In the sense that can there be other models where private sector or other players of the economy can play a role, such as education services, management contracts. Can there be companies that manage schools' infrastructures better? So that's a question I'd like to pose out there. I think Manipal K-12 is doing that. 
And thirdly, I think we need different types of schools. Globally, we are seeing things like forest schools where children are placed very close to nature. Things like schools for creativity, where those with certain artistic abilities are oriented right from the beginning. And then studios, studio schools, where a lot of entrepreneurship is encouraged. I'd also like to say we need entrepreneurship even at the K-12 level. And somebody like a camp K-12 is trying to do that. So I think given those few points, um, I think educational infrastructure affects, affects performance. So we have to really focus on the infrastructure that we have. Um, there's this concept of blended education, which is, you know, classroom, online, so everything is a blend now. There's phenomenon-based curriculum redesigns, again, you know, moving away from what were some of the normal trends to what are come up, some of the future challenges that are coming, and how do we get this phenomenon-based training into our curriculum, and centered student-centered learning environments, where the focus is on the student, maybe the individuality of the student. Uh, having said that, uh, a, a recent uh, uh, fig, you know, planning commission five-year plan said, there was a statement, this is now from the government, that the not-for-profit not status in higher education should be examined for pragmatic consideration so as to allow the entry of for-profit institutions in select areas for-profit higher education systems can be taxed and the revenues could be channeled into large-scale scholarship programs to promote equity. This is being practiced in Brazil and China. So I think with those words, I'd like to turn to the panel and really engage in a very good debate with them and with you eventually as to whether profits should be allowed in education. So first, I'd like to invite Mr. Sachin Pilot to give his comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I was a bit confused when you walked up the stage about uh, the topic that we were asked to discuss this morning. Um, but anyway, I think we've come back to the fact that we are deciding whether profits are a good thing for education or not. Uh, I'd just like to spend a few minutes in trying to uh, describe to you how I see the Indian system and where this question fits in or not. Uh, higher education is subsidized, tremendously so. But I think the challenge in India, and I heard the minister speak just before we came up, I don't think higher education is a challenge. Higher education for a lot of people in India is a, is a scarce resource, but also an opportunity. The challenge for us primarily is the basic and primary education, where the dropout rates are very high, the quality of education is not at all good. But profit making, is not the same as income surplus. How do you expect a school or a uh, institution to pay good salaries, to inculcate good talent in teaching, to be able to give the infrastructure so that our kids, you know, 5 to 15, that impressionable age group of youngsters and young children are able to get basic education? And then comes the larger question of how much to spend on IITs and IIMs. I think it's an irrelevant question. We need all. We need higher education and primary education. But when I think about profits, profits in this country have been seem to be an evil word. But who does not know that in this country, people give capitation in lakhs of rupees to get a seat in medical or engineering universities? How many poor people can actually start a school? A lot of people who are in the education business are quite well off. Now, how are they well off if they have no profits? So we're basically fooling ourselves to think that higher education does not involve profits. I think we have to be very practical about the whole education system. Focus more on the primary and secondary education. Profit making, and Supreme Court, I think, gave a very defining verdict a few years ago, where it said that just because you have some extra income or income surplus, does not deviate from your primary objective to exist as a contributor to societal gains by being an educationist or giving good education to our young people. If I look around us in, in our society, look at how much money comes into the Tirupati temple, for example, or Vaishnav Devi. Crores of rupees. Are they profit-making or they're centers of divinity and spirituality? 
So the main ethos and the main theme of these institutions does not get diluted because they have extra money. How they use the money is far more important whether we define this as profit or surplus income. Unless there is resource, unless there is money going into education, the government of any country, any state cannot by itself give quality education to all people. We have a law in our country, we have universal education, we have RTE, but do we have the resources to give our people in villages 650,000 villages in this country? I'm not saying you should allow private people to skim the profits and, and make you know, unlawful gains, but we've got to be able to allow people to come into this business of contributing to society by having enough resources. Now, taking a step back, think about schools. When you say schools should be subsidized, there should be no profit at all, people should not make any money. I agree with the fact that one cannot make money, it's not a business, and that's why there is no tax. There is no service tax, there is no other tax on, on school fees and university fees. I paid pittance, pittance for my uh, university education, but I know how much I pay for my young kids who go to schools, you know, class two or four or five. So there has to be rationalization of how much we need to pay. More importantly, schools aren't just buildings and teachers. There are textbooks, there is software, there are computers, and anybody who sells textbooks and computers and software to schools makes profit. We use Microsoft, how much money do they make? So it's not as easy as whether there should be no profit or not. Ingredients into our education system is made by components which are clearly making profit. Uh, so there has to be at least a larger understanding of whether we need to be open and transparent. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, how much money changes hands for higher education, it's a well-known fact. It's, a, it's an open secret. And yet we have this definition that institutions should not make profit. I think we must redefine what profit is. We must also categorize how that money could be reused in the objective for which it was created. And obviously, there can't be a, it's, it's not like a share market or an or a investment in a startup where you can make 40-50% profit on your investments. But there has to be enough money coming in. If we keep fooling ourselves and saying, no, we must be purely socialist, profit is evil, there should be no income surpluses in education system, then we'll end up with the same warp system that we have for so long. Therefore, there has to be rethinking. Uh, I don't think education is meant for profit-seeking and profit-making, but we cannot have a non-viable, non-functional, uneconomical education system. It just won't survive. And even the government needs to allow more transparency. When you say you're having private universities, look at how much they have to do. Why would private universities invest money uh, when they were making no quote-unquote profits? So either there is management of books, or there is falsification, or there's both. So this time has come where we have to be open and about, open about how we deal with our, because education purely is not just about allocation of money. I think it's the best investment any country or society can make. If you invest money in child education, it's going to reap benefits beyond our imaginations. So there has to be more people who are candid about this. Governments and private individuals need to be more understanding of the needs and requirements of today's young India, which is aspirational, and there is no substitute for good education. So therefore, we must not limit ourselves to this pure definition of profit versus non-profit. That's it. That's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you very much for that. And I'd like to now invite Mr. R. Sharat Kumar to give his comments. Good morning. As I walked in over here, I had the minister give an elaborate, uh, detailed aspects of education and how the government in the center is uh, having plans to improve the educational system of a country. And as we walked up here, they said, should politicians make educational policies? Well, I would like to answer that, and then though we have come back to profit making in education, I'd like to answer that, yes, the politicians should be first educated to make policies. So let us get our politicians to first get educated. Because <clears throat> that's the basics, very basic uh, loss there. When somebody is not educated, when somebody who does not understand the system, when somebody does not understand what is to be done for the country, definitely he cannot be a policymaker. And so let us make it very clear. And thank you for even opening up the topic. And we should have gone on a discussion on that. Currently, it's very, very essential for our state. So I thought I should make an impact on that. And well, coming back to the subject on profit-making, well, uh, 
Sachin made it very clear. The two aspects, education is basically a socio-economic need of a country. In 2025, the largest younger generation is going to be in our country. When that is so, I think that human resource that we are going to have has to be brain rich. They definitely have to get educated. Well, do they have the necessary tools to get educated? The necessary tools is right from primary to the college levels. The affordability comes in. That's where the profit making also comes in here. But with affordability goes quality. There's a recent, uh, I think, court order from Allahabad court stating that government servant children should go to government schools. Well, is that being uh, followed? I don't think so. Well, everybody wants the children. The basic needs of the country, of course, is food, shelter, and clothing. And the next most expensive thing or the people every household spends on is on education because everyone wants their children to get educated with. And that they feel when they go to the private institution is where the education is better than the government schools. It may not be so. All the government schools may, may not be bad. Well, the infrastructure is definitely not conducive for children to go to government schools. Let us face it. If that has to be improved, that is where the private institutions provide everything. Where does infrastructure come from? When you need hygiene, environmental uh, development in school and the compounds of the school, it needs resources. And the resources you have will come from private institutions and they have money to spend on them. And when they spend, there's got to be a little bit more profit. If not, they won't have the incentive to spend money on them. That even goes along with education. But you need infrastructure for developing sports as such. So every need of a school, every need of education today requires infrastructure, basic infrastructure, hygiene, environment. And if that is so, I think private uh, institutions have to make profits somewhere. But one thing is the government should think about their policies very deeply. And there should be basically a private-public uh, partnership and having uniformity in school education. That is where it lacks. The dropouts are uh, one too many. So basically, the money, the resources from the central government is not adequate. And also from the state government is not adequate to develop the government schools. So people do want to go to private schools. They feel the quality of education is better in private schools. Though the Honorable Minister said it's not the case. Even government schools do give good education. That is also there. But the teacher-student uh, ratio, and then how much, he also mentioned everything that we have to say over here. The refresher course for teachers, whether they go through the process, whether they are adequately equipped to teach the students of today, the technology that's developed, the teaching skills are developed, sitting from home you can get educated. So every, in, every, every development in the educational system needs money, and it is but fair for education for schools and institutions to make a minimum profit. And that is one thing that I feel is uh, necessary. But to develop a nation, private schools may be the, 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 the answer, but government schools, government institutions have to buck up. And policymakers should think well. And I think uh, foreign uh, you know, direct investment is not yet desired in the parliament yet. And such it should be. Uh, more knowledgeable on that because uh, I was in Parliament from 2001 to 2006 and that has still not been debated on uh, foreign direct invest by investment. If foreign direct investment 100% is given to education and we'll have more capital to spend on schools and colleges and surplus funds may be there. When surplus funds is there, definitely infrastructure development take place and our education system will take place. And as I came into this auditorium, before coming to the auditorium, I met some of the students from some of the institutions over here like Velamal, ask them, do you have any relation to what you are doing, what you are studying, and what you are going to be? Because I went to school, I went to college, I was in Delhi, I was born in Delhi, and then I came to Chennai, studied in Lila College, then did a degree in mathematics, but I have nothing to do with that, but I'm acting. And after acting, the immediate uh, handicap that you have is you become a politician in Tamil Nadu. That's an advantage that you have. We beat the others in the game. The people who really worked really hard, people who have really done a yeoman service to society, they have a backseat because... No, I, I'm there. I, my profession is acting. A politician can become an actor because they are acting. Okay. 
actor entertains the public but the uh, politician entertains the entire uh, country <laughs> so both everybody everybody is acting so it's better we stop acting some and come to rela- reality and start thinking what we should do for the system well let, let, such an is intervened into my question like in parliament <laughs> so what i was trying to say is mathematics do where do i apply this mathematics i don't apply it anywhere other than counting money it helped it was very helpful counting money it was very helpful even now that has been taken over by the machines so that is one thing like ashwin the cricketer is an engineer nitesh kumar is an engineer and he is a politician so i think basically when i spoke to those uh, students i said so we we take up a course we study that course and then we don't go towards that but we do some other job so i think these things have to also be looked into job oriented studies or vocational training should be there there were days when you could fix a fuse in your house today my kid will not know how to fix a fuse in the house he calls for an electrician and there is a demand for electrician and why can't we become electricians plumbers so i think our entire educational system the curriculum the pedagogy everything should be utilized and i i only say the human resource strength that india is going to have that has to be utilized well if that uh, that has to be utilized well i think the policy makers should very clearly think between the uh, uh, government schools and the uh, private schools and bring up a system where educational system itself uh, takes on and becomes uh, uh, available to everybody and it's easily accessible to every individual in the country and that's what i have got to say about it thank you thank you thank you mr shahid kumar for those comments i'm going to now turn to shaheen mistry uh, founder of uh, teach for india to really uh, give us some comments from her experience thank you so i'm uh, excited and grateful and nervous to be here i grew up um, terrified of cameras so sitting in between literally five screens is is very terrifying uh, for me um also uh, for the last 25 years i've woken up every morning asking myself the same question um how can i do a little bit more to provide an excellent education to the kids who need it the most in this country and my journey has been many many things but the one thing i realized when i got invited to speak that it's not been has been about any form of profit i realized that in 25 years i probably haven't thought about profit and so i was a little bit nervous thinking about what would i actually share and i started doing a lot of thinking about profit and what profit actually meant and i thought about a, a dear friend of mine nipun who tells a story about a press conference um similar big room like this where mother teresa was speaking and at the end of her speech a senior reporter came to her and said can i take a photograph of you and she said yes and she stood but he didn't like the photograph so he said can you move a little bit to the left and he still didn't like the picture and he said move a little bit to the right and he still didn't like the picture and finally he came and sort of turned her face so that he could get a good angle of her and the prince friend was sitting there sort of cringing thinking this is my idol my hero she's being objectified what is going on and so he went to mother teresa because he saw how calm she stayed through that whole incident and he said mother teresa were you not upset at being treated like that and mother teresa looked at him and said child there are many forms of poverty and so nipun thought about that and he said if there are many forms of poverty then there are also many forms of capital there are many forms of profit um and i want to share because it really shifted something as i heard him speak he talked about time capital that we don't think about what time capital means and and how today there are old age homes that put nursery schools in the middle of the old age home look at what a brilliant idea for elderly people to be able to contribute and give the love and life life experience to little children and then there's community capital and research today shows that families that literally every day just sit around the same dining table and talk those children have higher test scores 
than families that don't make that time to just eat together and talk over dinner. And then there's attention capital, and our attention span as human beings has gone down from 12 seconds to 8 seconds. And you think about initiatives like introducing mild mindfulness in school and things that are getting us to be more able to be in the present uh, moment. And finally, and the one I think about the most, there is social or, or service capital. And another beautiful story, um, there's a, a guy called Julio, and this is on the other side of the world in the U.S. in the bitter cold. He's walking down the road at night, and a teenager approaches him, hood over his head, comes up to him, pulls out a knife, and says, Julio, give me your wallet. And Julio, like I think most of us in this room, took his wallet out and gave it to that kid. Kid turned around, started running away, but then Julio unlike I think most of us, said, hey kid, the kid turned around and he said, it's a really cold night and you don't have a proper coat. Why don't you take my coat? True story. Hein? So he takes his coat off and gives it to this kid and the kid is sort of doesn't understand why he's done this, but he takes the coat, again turns to run off and Julio says, hey kid, Actually, I was just going down to my favorite diner to eat. Why don't you come with me? You could probably use a hot meal. And so Julio and this kid sit and talk for two hours, and the kid opens up about his life and what has made him turn to crime. And at the end of the dinner, um, he looks uh, at Julio, and he says, um, oh, no, sorry, Julio looks at the kid and says, kid, I would have loved to buy you dinner but you have my wallet. Um, and so the kid takes the wallet and slides it across the table and Julio says, that's not enough. I need one more thing from you. I need the knife. And the kid gives him the knife and they walk off and probably never see each other again. But I think about that idea of social capital. What has that done for the kid, but what has it done for Julio? And so the work that I do at, at Teach for India is trying to link that also back to this idea of profit and capital. We do something a little bit crazy. We ask the best and brightest and most committed people in the country, people like yourselves, whether they're young, 23 years old, just out of college, or they're working professionals, to come full time and teach for two years in the poorest schools. And again, think about the capital time and service capital. Yes, they're giving two years of their lives, but they're creating opportunities to turn around the lives of 40, 50 children in the two years. And they're going on after the two years to work across sectors, but with this shared vision and commitment that until, what our union minister said, until every child gets a quality education, we're not actually done. And so I think about that, attention capital, time capital, service capital, aren't those equally important to financial capital? And can we think of profit in that way? And I wanted to end, if you'll indulge me, um, as I thought about this with, I'm basically a teacher. Um, and so a poem that I wrote after I had a very um, small incident one day in Mumbai where I live, where I walked down the street and a little girl on the street asked me for money and it inspired me to write something which I think is, is relevant to this idea. So this is called What Get Said to Give and What Give Taught Get. So get said to give in order to live, just take what you can, be rich, dearest man. Learn to grab and to claw, always want more, 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 and don't stop to think what you're wanting is for. Be rich, man, be cool, send your kid to a school where he'll grow up to be a rich get, just like me. Then give, interrupted, get, stop, get, please stop. All this talk of just making it up to the top is making me giddy and dizzy and fizzy and sick. You're up to no good, get, I know all your tricks. You're making these people think love can be bought, that happiness tickets with money are brought. 
I know your type, Get. I used to be you till I stumbled on giving and what it could do. And that is the thing I must share here with you. I used to feel good, Get, just giving away some old clothes, the torn ones, the jeans that were frayed. Then one day a child said he dreamed he could play with a new toy, a new toy, not my giveaway. So I went out and bought Get a shirt that was cool, thinking about what he'd wear after school, and a toy car I bought him of shiny, bright blue. I thought of what six-year-old boys like to do, and the smile that he gave, Get that smile, it was real, so real that my heart did not know how to feel. And the next day while walking, I saw a small child. She asked for some money. Her hair was quite wild. And when I said no, she pointed afar to a coconut vendor behind all the cars. I followed her zigzag across Mumbai's loud street. We sat down with coconuts on dusty tar seats. Just me and the little girl sip sipping away. A sliver of joy had slipped in my day. And as we were chatting about things that she chose, a man not too far watched, then quietly rose, and then came towards us and almost ashamed, gave a bright shiny apple, then left as he came. And you see, get, you see, get, when you start to give, you pave roads for the others to change how they live. When you first start to look at it, may be a haze, but many are giving, you will be amazed. The tree, how it gives of its fruit and its shade. The carpenter gives of the wood that he has made. The teacher, she gives every student her right. The puppy, he fills every heart with delight. The farmer, he gives of his hard-earned new crop. The sun gives us light till the moon says to stop. The temple and mosque really say we are one. The swing takes us high, up and down kind of fun. And music, she gives us a world that is free and dreams how they teach us just what we can be. So I watched get, I watched, and I learned how to give, how to always have hope, how to love and forgive, to compare myself down, to feel thanks, to want less, yet I learned to share more. Yet I learned to feel blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Shaheen. I'm sure we will touch with that. So I'll just take maybe one round of uh, discussion further and then open it up. Uh, you know, Shaheen, um, I'll come to you, but I'll give the others a chance to think about it, about an idea. So recently I was at the uh, something called the Social Innovation Exchange, where we had uh, actually uh, something called Make a Difference Mad Institute of Hong Kong, which came up with many different models of schools. So I'll come to you on that. And then uh, last week, actually, in Delhi, we ourselves held something on EdTech. So we can't forget EdTech when we are talking about profits. So my question to each of the panelists is, what is one big idea for the future? You know, what is that one thing you can think of that could perhaps originate from India, could perhaps revolutionize you know, education here. So I'll give you a chance to think on that while I go back to Shahid for India is amazing. So this one idea at six was that, you know, we need more teachers. So, like, why not, you know, the people who come to teach for India, why not sort of train them for six weeks, but then let them maybe continue as teachers. And the point is you're not the for, you're not doing the formal cur curriculum, but maybe a course or two, something more experiential, something bringing you know the current needs to the table. Uh, what do you think about that? Could we open up the teacher world to anybody who wants to teach? That's a question. And then. Yeah, so I think that the fellowship is a very intensive two-year full-time commitment because we believe we need to really... Um, teach people what it means to actually turn around kids' lives, and that takes time and hard work. But in addition to that, we welcome volunteers who can come in once a week, do one-off projects um, uh, similar to what, what you actually shared. So there are many, many different ways to get um, involved. And we're really, our belief is that unless every Indian in India stands up and does something 
for our children. There's just no way to actually solve this problem. Um, and so that, that's a very, very important point. Can I quickly answer your first question, though? I think that the big idea for me in education that will um, change the world is the idea that we have to repurpose education from being just about exams to get a job to fulfill my individual potential to also and as importantly being about contribution to the world and that we have to link those two things. If I can make, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I had a six-year-old come and have a meeting with me last week. He had come from America. Proper meeting. He wanted to meet with me. He had baked brownies at his house, had a sale, and then done research, found Teach for India, and decided to donate money to Teach for India. And I was thinking about the fact that that six-year-old is already a leader in his own right. If we can make our children feel that education is not the future, it's the present, and however much money I have, whatever age I am, today I can start caring about a problem and driving my education and learning through that, I think we can really revolutionize education. Thank you. Sachin, can I turn to you? In our history, uh, we've had a lot of successes, a lot of failures, but um, I keep coming back to the point that allocating money or putting money in education uh, is an investment, the best that we can make individually, collectively, as governments and as society. If we are able to think about our young children, forget about the young people who are educated and are unemployed. I think the minister was talking about skilling 10 million people. The number's wrong. I think you need 15 million new jobs every year to sustain the current level of unemployment, uh, let alone the new ones that are adding to our workforce. So why should we not think about first strengthening our foundations? He talked about the root and the tree and the branch. I think more than the fruit and the leaves, the roots are far more important. Why don't we take as a commitment from our in our country, have a consensus around this across political parties, across states, and say, like the UN had the MDGs, why can't we have something like this in India that in the next 10 years, every single child in this country will be educated till class 10. And we've had successes when, when India decides to do something, for example, the polio eradication program, you know, the go boom, uh, polio, those drops. That was a phenomenal success. We were able to achieve it, whether it's marketing, whether it's involvement, whether it's co-opting, we are able to do all those things once we have a singular focus on what you want to do. Unfortunately, and I say this with some regret, education is not a politically important idea. No one gets voted in or voted out because the quality of education is poor. Whether, you know, and and that also goes, says true for things like undernourishment and malnourishment. 43% of kids in this country below the age of five are either undernourished or malnourished. Now how do you expect a hungry young child to go and excel in a classroom. It's not possible. They have to go hand in hand. But I'm glad we have in India the world's largest feeding program. The mid-day meal program, I think, is, is, is seminal in its success. Uh, and also in, in, incentivizes parents to send the kids because they get a hot, hot fresh cookly, uh, freshly cooked meal, and that adds on to the education. So why can't we think of, forget about you know, sending a satellite to Mars. I mean, that can happen as well. But why don't we as a nation decide to say in the next 10 years, Every single child of school going age will be given education. Forget passing laws, that's one part of it. The execution and the implementation is far more important. Private entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, business houses, corporate houses, state governments, municipal governments, people's representatives, across political parties. Focus on this, because if we don't do this, I can assure you in the next 20 years, this young population of not unemployed adults, but school going dropouts, they are going to be a far more bigger economic problem for us than anything else because they are going to be non-contributing to our society, are going to be an economic baggage, they'll be young and restless and have all sorts of issues. So this education is not about just whether we should have profits or not. It's an imperative requirement for our country to sustain its level of growth. We cannot become a developed country. No country has become a developed country when it's young and not gone to school. It's simple as that. History will tell you. So education is important, higher education is very important, but the fundamental basis of our education lies in the primary, second education, and government schools, Kendra Vidyalas are good schools. Why can't all government schools be like the KVs? 
it's not that difficult to achieve. If we as a country, when we come together, we have achieved far greater, greater targets and no challenge is in, 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 insurmountable if we are committed to it. I think on this particular issue, there should be no division of views in terms of policies and parties and politics. We can certainly achieve this. So my view, I think, without wasting any more time, we must have a timeline, 8, 10, 15, whatever years we decide to do, and do it uh, with a commitment and, and have the results, because unless we have parameters of timelines and, and, and judging successes, a mere budgetary allocations, speeches, seminars, conferences, showing how much we worry about is not going to help. We've got to really do it with action. And the basic problem lies not in urban India, but primarily in rural India. And some of the states have done well, some haven't done well, Mizoram has done well, Kerala has done well, why can't other states do it? So I think full quality education to all school going kids in the next 10 years as a national objective could be a starting point. Thank you. And let me hand over to Shah. See, what should be the decision to be taken on education in the future is very, very clear. Like I, in my opening remarks I made, the youngest population is going to be in our country in 2025, as it is said. The human resources should be converted into human capital. If that has to be done, we surely need to educate every single person, as such and rightly put it, an intelligent mind without being employed somewhere, is going to turn our country into a revolutionary state. That is exactly the question put to the minister, which he said he will reserve his answer later, because he didn't want to address it directly, because now there is a frustration. There is frustration that is taking over all the college campuses and youngsters across our country, where they are trying to express it in different ways, taking up issues and fighting for it. I think the brain has to be enriched, and they have to be educated. So, cutting across party lines, there should be a very clear education policy where we have to get, get our youth of today to educate it because we are going to be one of the most powerful countries in the future if we employ and use with the tools that we have, the human resource that we have, if we can get it across, instead of exporting goods, we'll be exporting brain from our country, which will be less in other countries because there'll be age limits where definitely youth in our country will be 25 to 35 is going to be more in our country so that they have to be really utilized and used we have a great resource and that resource we definitely have to improve the quality education however way and if the quality education has to come every way right from the teachers right from the schools right from the infrastructure right from the government the policy makers we have to come together in this and like uh, Sachin rightly put it going to Mars going to moon and you know, doing all sorts of scientific uh, developments and uh, all this is not going to help because we have not used any of our brains over here. We have been, uh, I mean, there's a brain drain from our country. They say many, almost 24% of our engineers are working in NASA. Maybe it's a proud uh, statement for us to hear. But why don't we think of reverse brain drain? Why don't we try to bring them back into our country? Make our country a better place to live. If you when you make a better place to live, they can come back here. Are they using the CSR as well? So if the corporate social responsibility, they're going to spend money in trying to take up. I would say, if you are giving a permission to a factory somewhere, tell them to take over that particular village or the place that they are and try to invest in the schools, try to invest in the education institution instead of giving capitation fees. Tell them you spend over here, we give you permission so that you construct your factory, you develop these schools, you develop educational system. So I think education has to be given topmost priority in the country and that will be the uh, future of our country where the youth will definitely get employed in the right places and skill development and all the capital that could be diverted should be towards educating our youth of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me quickly open up the floor. Uh, there's a gentleman here with the mic, please. And also if you could get another working mic up here. This one is not working. Thank you. Um, my name is Vaidya Subramaniam. I'm the Dean of Shastra University. I have a question for uh, Sachin. Uh, see, whenever I've seen many of these institutions that kind of, uh, you know, they brutally uh, display these uh, 
physical infrastructure, big auditorium, Olympic size swimming pools and polo grounds and education. I have nothing against that. But the fundamental uh, objective of social enterprises is what is the outcome that these educational institutions are generating. And hence, there is an emerging paradigm today that is sandwiched between not-for-profit institutions and for-profit institutions. And that emerging paradigm is called not-for-loss institutions. And that is measured by the extent to which they are able to create a, a new uh, coinage that is emerging called the social alpha. So educational institutions must generate uh, some social output measured by this indicator called social alpha, which focuses more on educational outcomes and not just physical infrastructure, because invariably physical infrastructure is often used as an excuse for profiteering. Nobody is against you know, that reasonable surplus that you are talking about. But to flip it around, it would be a better way to think of not for loss enterprises. What's your opinion on that? Frankly, I don't agree with you uh, in totality, because once you start with the mindset of not for loss, what does that mean? <laughs> it means you're starting with a negative outlook. Look, around the world, let's say, just on top of my head, one of the most famous universities in the world is the Harvard University, right? Even the Honorable Prime Minister made a comment about it two days ago. Now, Harvard University is not a cheap place to go to. You know, the fund of the Harvard University is close to $40 billion. That's the Harvard Fund. And they have investments, they you know, make interest and they do so and so. Can anybody here say that Harvard is a profit-seeking institution? That the only objective for what it was founded for was to make money? No. It still retains its position as a top institute because it has, what you said, social outcomes. You go to a place, say, I'm a Harvard graduate, pretty much get the job straight away. Second of all, infrastructure is almost as important as the students and the teachers there. Because you cannot have a world standard university or a school uh, under a tree. It's, I've seen many gurukuls in Hastinapur in UP, then they teach all those Vedic things and they're very great and spiritually you know, much more related than I am. But you can't compete globally without having those kind of infrastructures. Now to have that infrastructure, you need to have some cash flows. All I've said in the beginning was, make it transparent. Why pay lakhs of rupees of capitation in cash to get a seat of education in engineering or medical college? Everybody knows it. You tell me one person in this room who does not know this. So how long will you keep fooling ourselves and saying that this, you can only have a school or a college under a Societies Act where you cannot make profits uh, and you can't show any income as well? Because once you show income, you get disqualified and you can't exist as an education institution. So it's very complex. We have kind of put ourselves in this web where we're not able to face the reality of today. I paid 10,000 rupees per year when I was doing my undergraduate degree in Delhi University, St. Stephen's College. 10,000 rupees a year, maybe less than that. How do you expect a university to give what the minister was saying, two and a half lakh rupees per person per year? It's probably a rough figure. I'm not saying we should put all the onus on the, on the uh, students and the families, but there has to be parity. I'd rather put that money and have from class one to class 10 good schools in every district, in every panchayat headquarter. There are only two and a half lakh panchayat in this country. We are in India which has 14 lakh army soldiers. I mean, we have so much. Why can't we make uh, one school per panchayat, which is quality school education, which is open for scrutiny, and it should make enough money to sustain itself. If it's not economically viable, you won't get good teachers, you won't get good infrastructure. And I made the point earlier on that when you have computers and textbooks and software that is sold for profit and schools are now supposed to be making no money at all and they have to be a not for loss or, or a non-profit, it doesn't make sense. So we have this facade of socialism where we can't say that anybody can make money. It should not be the single motive of having an education institution. If a Birla or a Tata or a Alliance wants to make a university, we somehow think that all they're trying to do is make a you know, few extra crores. But if the objective is there and they have a transparent system, they have online you know, uh, scrutiny, it could be part of CSR, etc. But it can't be done with this mindset that we won't allow profits. I don't think education is there for profit, but unless you have enough money and cash flow in and out of the education system, you cannot have a country as large and diverse as India to have good, functional, viable, quality education for our primary schools. And I focus more on primary because unless the foundations are strong, you can't have aspirational young adults wanting to become engineers and doctors. It just won't happen. The dropout is too high.
Good day, sir. Good day to the panel members who are sitting on the chair. Right behind. Uh, yes, just give us a hand. I'm standing here. Glad to get a question from the back. Um, good day, sir. Uh, my question, I'm an assistant professor. I'm Ms. Susan. I'm an assistant professor at Galaxy Institute of Management. I have one question. The question is regarding uh, Tamil Nadu and India. It's a combination of both. But one question I want, I want to ask is, why education still is a caste based? What is the reason behind the caste? Well, education still is a caste based. Who are you asking the question to? Who would you like? If, if Sharad sir is answering, I will be better because he is from Tamil Nadu. I think that sir knows about the politics that is only in Tamil Nadu. Well, I did not understand your question of caste based education. I don't know where is it. That, how, how, how do you say that it's a caste based education existing in the Sir, it is quota based, sir. It is quota based. Wherever you say. about reservations, basically. Yes, sir. I am saying about all the reservations. Wherever, reservations starting are. from the UGC to the, uh, what do you call this, the lower uh, education. Starting from the higher education to the lower education, it is caste based. And quota based, you, if you see whatever it is. We yeah, understood what you asked. Yes, uh, yes, sir. See, basically, uh, if this is a very deeper discussion on reservations. See, there will be about uh, 100 uh, camera personalities outside once you hear me talking about reservations over here. Where in Maharashtra is about 74 percent, other places about 50 percent, and in Tamil Nadu, other things it's about 69 percent of reservation. We talk about reservations. This is again a decision made by politicians. This is made by the lawmakers, and not that I am not a politician. I am also a politician. I would like to be a different kind of a politician in the future years to come. But uh, the education system should it have reservation or not is a very very deeper discussion and debate. I guess just cannot give an answer straight away and say uh, it cannot be uh, this. Basically, why was reservation there? It's because, you know, a person who is lesser fortunate has to also be educated. But should that continue when that person gets educated and he is in a position of economic, uh, uh, I mean, uh, good back, economic background, growth is fine. And should he continue with his children too, will be a question in the future he has to answer. But the competitive examination like NEET, everything depends on the quality of education. And let us not bring the reservations over here. But should reservations go or not is for the future years to decide. It is again the students who start thinking whether we will become a quality doctor, we like to become a quality engineer and how we should get into the institution, whether we should take the NEET, whether we should not take the NEET, all these things. Of course, basically we have to improve the quality of education throughout the country before even Tamil Nadu basically. We have to improve the uh, education levels for the uh, students to be competitive enough to take the NEET exams. So all these reservations may not go immediately, but the question that you asked may be a future year, years to come. We should have to address it, and we will address it. We have to address it. There are so many people, you know, policy makers, will definitely take notice of this and cognizance of this, and definitely it should be answered in the future years to come. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We'll ask a couple of questions for this session. Yes, to Mr. Sachin Pilot. Uh, the education we have today is based on memory-based. It's more on mark based. There are a lot of children who may not be able to be good in memory based. Rather, they may be talented either in drawing or sports or something. Why not we have a system wherein the talent of the child is identified on given Philip so that they develop and stand on their own leg? I think you're right, sir, but first let's tackle the issue at hand. Literacy and education are two different things. We are struggling to make our young population literate. And you're right, young minds, some of them are not trained to mug up and conventional our education system needs to be challenged and changed to a point. But I think that's a secondary question. I think it's important. We must address it at some point. But if you travel around this country of ours, you will find that whether it's women, whether it's young children, whether it's the socially, educationally backward classes of people, uh, I won't go into the details, a lot of them are not literate. You, we're looking at opening bank accounts, we're looking at cashless transactions, we're looking at digital India, which is all great, but you can't do that when 35% of your country is illiterate. Forget education and forget diplomas and degrees and engineering and medicine. I'm talking about literacy and those are the people who will really be a drag when this country wants to grow 10% a year. 
And I don't think any country can have a holistic economic development purely based on numbers and, and, and data if we have one third of our country which is not literate. I mean, that's an imposing challenge, sir. I think that's far more important than whether it should be memory-based or application-based or so on and so forth. We can certainly tinker with the policy. And I can guarantee you, policy-making in this country is a very keenly interesting job. Everybody wants to do it. There are lots of politicians far better than me and other people on this panel who will think about doing it. But as a nation, as a concerned citizen, and even as a young adult who today is educated and employed, I can assure you, you will not have a fully developed country if you have one third of our countrymen in far corners of India living a life of illiteracy, uh, who have no resources, who are not lucky enough to send their kids even to a government school. And I say this to all the campuses, I visit a lot of campuses in Rajasthan and I tell every single college student, I said don't ever forget the fact that you are lucky, you are blessed, that you have this campus and university to study in. There are millions and millions of kids who are aspiring to go to a school half as good as this but don't have the money or the access to get to, get to it. So we really have to be conscious of how blessed we are that we can even sit here and go to these colleges and sometimes we take it for granted. It's as, as if it's come from the skies. It's been brought to us. So we must be really conscious of the fact. And I, as a politician, I believe at least my generation of politicians, I, I won't make comments on other people, but my generation of politicians will certainly be judged upon how much education and economic opportunity we provide to our younger people. It's, it's not about sloganeering, it's not about winning elections and coming to power. I think I and people like myself will be judged that in my working life, how much opportunity did I open up for my young countrymen to be competitive globally, to be competitive in this country, and to have the opportunity to, to tap into the talents that they have. There's so much potential, but it'll all go to rest unless they get that basic education foundation. And then, of course, once you have good educated people, they'll compete nationally, globally. And today, a young person in Chennai is not competing with a young person in Bombay and Delhi. They're competing with people around the world for those jobs. And, you know, just final point I want to make, a little aside from your question, sir. Who makes our curriculum? Who decides what we study? Should it be a... PMK, DMK, Congress, BJP, Janta Dal person? Uh, should it be a journalist or a uh, person who's, who's biased? I think the question of curriculum and syllabus is so crucial and important that it must be far away from politics. We must have a non-biased, intellectual, academic group of people who decides what's best for us and keep reinventing it every five years. Because what I studied 20 years ago in college is perhaps useless now because the world has changed. But I'm making this point because I've seen in the last few years this lot of pampering about what we should study. In my state of Rajasthan, they're doing all this, you know, questionable additions and deletions to courses and syllabus, which I think is not based on merit. And it's not a political platform, so I won't go into details. But the minister there said that, you know, the only animal that breathes out oxygen is the cow. And he stands by his statement. Now, when someone like that decides to, you know, intervene in the cerebrus and the curriculum, I think it, it, it really is, is, a, is a, not a positive impact on, on how education systems should be followed. I just made that point because I think politicians should be aware that people are watching. And once you make and do things and you, with your actions, are, are questioning the entire system and imposing your own... Ms. Shaheen Mistri. Ms. Preeti Sinha. And Mr. Sharad Kumar. A quick group photo opportunity before we let you go. Thank you so much for being here and bringing out some very valuable points. We thoroughly enjoyed it and this gives us a lot of food for thought. Thank you. Thank you very much.